My guest is George Kane. Welcome, George. Thank you, James. If you watch this program frequently, you probably are used to seeing George sitting over here doing the interviewing, but today he's going to be our guest. Uh, George has been a longtime member of the Board of Directors of Minnesota Atheists. He served as the president, as chair. Uh, currently, he serves as one of the directors at large. Uh, for many years, he assisted in the editing of the Minnesota Atheist newsletter. But today, like I said, we're going to be delving into critical thinking, um, specifically the Critical Thinking Club. You are one of the founders of that club. So why don't we, before we talk about critical thinking, let's talk about the club itself, and maybe you can tell us how that evolved. Sure. The club started in January of 2000. We held our first meeting. Lee Salisbury got the idea for it, and he recruited a few of us to work on launching the club. And we meet, there are three chapters now, and each chapter meets monthly. The St. Paul chapter meets at the Kelly Inn on the first Sunday. The Stillwater Club meets at the Family Means Building on the second Monday. And on the fourth Saturday, the West Metro Club meets at uh, Ridge Point Apartment Buildings. Okay. And I think we have the a Meetup talking. website is going to go up during the show here on the screen for people to see. Right. We've made a meetup for it, and that's how we manage our uh, room reservations and things. We require the RSVPs that we know how many people mm -hmm. are going to show up. And the format for it, we've experimented with different formats, but what all the clubs do now is we have a featured presentation, which usually lasts around 40 minutes, and then we break up into groups by table and conduct table talk, which is either an evaluation of the critical thinking merits of the presentation or else some exercise, some discussion topic that the presenter has provided for it. And then we report back by table and usually have some time to finish with questions and answers. Oh, okay. Is the presenter usually a club member that was assigned or volunteered? The usually, yes. We ask for volunteers. Mm -hmm. And the club rule, I tell people at every meeting that if they're a first-time attendee, mm -hmm. That all they have to do to become a club member is attend one session, and they're already there. So they just <laughs> they're already to... inducted. Right. Yeah. So all they have to do is stay through the meeting, yeah. and they're a club member, and they are then eligible to give presentations. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, we've drawn from outside, but the great majority of our presentations come from members. Sure. Okay. Um, so now that we know about the club, and we'll, we'll touch on that again later, but maybe you can tell our viewers what is critical thinking exactly. Sure. There are a lot of... There are different definitions of critical thinking. It's defined in various ways. The definition that I like is, is uh, evaluation of evidence and testimony to reach justified conclusions. Justified, not just any conclusions. Not yeah. just any conclusions. Right. Yeah. right. And there are different values, mental attributes, of critical thinkers, the most core, the most basic, I think. First off, that it's a truth-seeking activity. If your objective is to win arguments mm -hmm. against people, well, you're probably better off studying rhetoric mm -hmm. sure, uh, yeah. or persuasive speaking. And that's a very different toolkit. Mm -hmm. The toolkit of critical thinking is to try to avoid error, and that's on your own part. Mm -hmm. Trying to persuade other people involves uh, selection of, of evidence and testimony right. and so on. And perhaps your Very own different. inherent speaking skills and right. <laughs> personality. Yeah. Right. <laughs> a, a second uh, mental attribute of critical thinking is uh, being aware of and accounting for biases. And that can be biases in the evidence. For example, a, a small sample size of if you're doing a survey. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, or there may be biases in the, in the, the survey that uh, where it was taken, even time of day, that sort of thing. There can be bias testimony, and there are your own biases. And those are the most important to be aware of and account for. Things like confirmation bias, that if you believed in one answer beforehand, mm -hmm. what you're going to see yeah. is very likely to be a confirmation of what you were going in expecting to see. Yeah, I think those would be the hardest to, to spot and right. counteract. Yeah, right. that's what you found too. Yep. <laughs> and then the third is fallibility. 
Now, in formal logic, in mathematics, deductive reasoning, you're dealing with in a realm of certainty. If your premises are correct, you know, you get answers and you know with complete certainty that, that that's correct. In critical thinking, we're really never uh, experiencing that sort of certainty, right, but rather yeah. it's uh, always a matter of probability that there's always the possibility that you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And so falsifiability is an important approach, that if you have an idea that you're accepting, try to disprove it. Ask yourself, what would it take to prove that I'm wrong with this? And then see if it's... If, if it can stand that test. Because so you're saying that if someone can say there's nothing that would convince me, then maybe you have some soul searching to do, or it's probably not <laughs> critical thinking yeah, that he's engaging okay. in. And we covered the recognition of bias. Yep. Oh, okay. So here's the next question. So is critical thinking just logic? Just a fancy way of saying logic? Well, logic is a tool, mm -hmm. but critical thinking really is a more practical activity. Now, it's widely uh, applied and tools such as uh, formal logic uh, can can be important. Uh, in fact, one of the ways to analyze an argument is going to be for logical consistency, for logical errors. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of practical analysis, besides the tools of predicate and sentential logic, which is really just mathematics, that we're looking at uh, other types of errors that, uh, to, in the state of critical thinking, you get trained to uh, catch, and these are called logical fallacies, or just fallacies. Things such as, uh, and, and we can discuss uh, quite a few of these later on uh, if we have time, but uh, argumentum ad hominem, an attack against the person rather mm -hmm. than the yeah. argument. And there are quite a few of quite a few logical fallacies, and occasionally we deal with those in Critical Thinking Club. Do you guys like have a list of the logical fallacies for people to refer to? Or to well, uh, there are lists easily available. Oh, okay. If you go yeah. to uh, the Internet Infidels, they have a very complete list and discussion of the different logical fallacies with all the Latin names. Yeah. Now we okay. usually don't worry too much about right. the, the Latin names. But if you want to win an argument, using Latin sometimes can help. <laughs> yeah, but as I said, critical <laughs> no, thinking, we're not too concerned with, <laughs> no, with winning the arguments, so just while, avoiding while, error. While we're talking about definitions here, what about critical thinking then is critical? I mean, why, why that word then? Yeah. People often think of criticism as being entirely negative. Yes, that's what I was going to say, yeah. Sometimes harsh. Whereas the Greek origin of the term critical, criticize, really just means to evaluate, to judge. And so uh, critical thinking, the word critical, is usually meant to be synonymous with skeptical. Okay. Or not uh, taking information, testimony on face value, but trying to evaluate how it fits in with all the other evidence and questioning its importance and its correctness. Yeah, sometimes skeptical has a negative connotation too, but then so does gullible. Oh, So yeah. it's hard to think of a, a, a word that doesn't create some sort of negativity in someone's mind. Right. Uh, when I think of skeptical, I usually oppose it to faith. Mm -hmm. There are two ways of trying to understand the world. Skeptical and faith, of those two approaches, which one is more likely to lead to correct answers? Yeah, good point. <laughs> um, that gets us to our next issue in, in just a second here. But um, So would, is it fair then to say that uh, being critical and critically thinking about something, is that the same term? Are those synonymous? You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of times people will say, uh, I'm critical of this, or I listened to what a critic wrote about a film. You know, is that critical thinking in action Well, a, a, a critic is evaluating. Mm -hmm. Critics say good things. A right, cri yeah. critical thinker may think very highly of an argument, mm -hmm. of, of uh, a theory that's presented, or of anything like that. Uh, so it's not necessarily negative. I think, just think that the, it's... Uh, the association of criticism with negativity yeah. is 
rather modern uh, uh, association, modern connotation. We've um, spent some time here talking about you know logic and making sure mm -hmm. that your arguments are sound. So then, when we mention critics, are they sometimes just spouting opinion because if they say they enjoyed a film or didn't, isn't that opinion? Like if they prefer chocolate over vanilla? Sure, and it may be completely subjective. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there are different types of knowledge, different types of, of arguments that require a different type of epistemology. Sure. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, absolutists who think that there is uh, an objective reality of situations and uh, so the knowledge is discovered. We have to find out what the objective situation is. There are relativists who regard situations as completely subjective. And then there are false, uh, uh, fallibilists who think that uh, all the information we have, the external world, uh, is true to a degree. <laughs> and then there's a d uh, the, d the realm of things that we don't know. And different types of things that you're going to look at are going to require a different approach. And I think that criticism of literature, criticism of, uh, of art, that sort of thing, uh, has, is largely based on subjective reaction, uh, largely based on very different uh, theories of criticism, uh, literary and artistic criticism, so that that is really the realm of a relativist. Okay. You know, you just mentioned a few minutes ago about the, the difference, the binary of skepticism to faith. What, since this is atheist talk after mm -hmm. all, what's the relationship between critical thinking and atheism? Yeah, I think that it's basically that word skeptical, that uh, skepticism is a mental attribute, a cognitive attribute of critical thinkers, and it's certainly one that atheists apply to the supernatural gods or supernatural uh, forces that are the core of, uh, core of religion. Now, getting back to the Critical Thinking Club, when we started the group back in 2000, we had a couple of slogans that we haven't really kept up with, but uh, uh, one of them was we thought that uh, if, you're a critical, uh, if you're a Christian, critical thinking will make you a better Christian. If you're an atheist, critical thinking will make you a better atheist, mm -hmm. and so on with every other uh, noun, adjective. You know, if yeah. you're a Democrat or liberal yeah. or conservative, that critical thinking would make you better at it. And when we started the club, we were a much more diverse group than we've become. We did have more Christians, a wider political spectrum, but as things have gone on, just due to self-selection, the uh, diversity of the club has narrowed quite a bit. I think that the preponderance of members of the club are atheists, are liberal politically, and it certainly has not been our intent to chase people away, but I think that uh, as the conservatives and Christians and so on had left the club, that maybe new people, when they come by, find the liberals, atheists who join the club, find the group more accommodating, more appealing sure. to them. And so they're more likely to stay. So are you worried that the clubs are, the, the chapters of the club become biased in a certain way? Then That's, because you're missing that diversity? Or do you think that, I, I mean, obviously you're an atheist, so then do you feel that the critical thinking that they witnessed there made Christians feel uncomfortable and they just left and that's just that? I mean, well. Well, both are, bo both are true. I do have uh, some anxiety that uh, we're building people's confirmation bias, mm -hmm. that they have a view of the world and come to the critical thinking club and are spending too much time discussing issues with people who have very similar views yeah. to their own. So uh, we do things to try to uh, get people to step out of it. I was very d discouraged, uh, disappointed, I should say. Uh, about a year ago, there's one uh, very regular attendee at that time. He's since moved out of state. But he mentioned in, in one discussion that, that we had um, an open from the floor discussion that he would never watch Fox News or read a conservative uh, columnist 
because he knew that he'd disagree with them. <laughs> Heaven forbid. That is yes. har hardly the yeah. uh, uh, a fitting ad attitude, yeah. attribute for a critical thinker. Let, actually, though, that brings up a good point, because mm -hmm. um, let's also talk about the relationship between critical thinking and politics, because mm -hmm. especially in the last decade or so, that's really seemed to polarize our nation. Yep. Do people even talk, uh, not people, uh, the media talks about red and blue states even now, you know, mm -hmm. as if everyone's in this binary. So how does that fit in? Well, I think that you have self-selection again coming in. Uh, I've read studies, and I think they're probably true in large part, that there's enormous self-selection going on that's dividing the population, that most people live in neighborhoods where most of their neighbors have a similar mm -hmm. uh, political uh, stripe. Most people uh, work in offices in which there's a general political consensus. Most people go to affinity groups, such as Critical Thinking Club or Minnesota Atheists, in which they're with people who have large, you know, very similar political views. That most people don't spend a lot of time associating with people who are polar opposites. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a large part of it. Critical thinking, of course, is important for uh, being able to evaluate political arguments. I think it's very important, uh, contrary to what this critical thinker member of the club that I met, just mentioned had done, I think it's very important to listen to the other side, but it's difficult for people to do emotionally. I find that uh, I know so many people who say, I can't watch Fox News because I get so angry. Well, uh, that sort of emotional reaction is not a cognitive attribute no, of, yeah. of, of good critical thinking. I had an incident myself a couple of months ago. Um, I'll bring up now. Uh, I have a personal hypothesis that if you cannot argue for a position that you disagree with, that you probably don't understand it. A devil's advocate mm -hmm. type position. And that is just an alarm that I've developed that I think is a good critical thinking practice, a good habit, that if I don't understand a position, if I can't s state what the arguments are for it, then I expect that I don't understand it and I'd better find out what the basis of it is. And that happened uh, early in February when there was a story that was being carried on every program in the evening on MSNBC uh, reporting that in uh, Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania and Virginia, I believe they were, that the legislatures were uh, proposing a, a change in the allocation of their state's electoral college votes. These are all states that uh, went for Obama in the presidential election and yet have Republican legislatures. And they were proposing that instead of awarding electoral college votes on a winner-take-all basis, mm -hmm. that instead they be awarded by electoral college, uh, excuse me, by uh, the districts, by congressional sure, districts. Yeah. And each state has the total number of, of uh, electoral college electors that they have representatives yeah. in, in Congress. So the, what they were proposing was that there be one elector from each congressional district and then the candidate who won the most uh, districts would get additionally two votes representing two, yeah. the two senators. Mm -hmm. And had it been done this way, in Virginia, which I believe was uh, all 14 electors went for Obama and he won by 4%, mm -hmm. won the state. And instead, it would, have, it would have gone with Obama getting only four votes and, uh, and uh, Romney, who lost the state, would have gotten, would have the, gotten bulk the, of the, the bulk yeah, of them. Sure. And I heard, and of course on MSNBC, and they were interviewing uh, Democratic politicians and so on, and everyone was condemning this as uh, an attempt to rig the elections 
that the Republicans can't win the popular vote, and so they want to game the system and win it in the Electoral College by, through underhanded means. And I thought that it was right, that they were gain, trying to gain mm -hmm. political advantage. But I felt that the Republicans have to be going on television, going on radio interviews, and trying to justify the, the bills right. that they're proposing. And what are they saying? How are they justifying this to anyone? And I couldn't figure it out. So I realized I had to watch Fox News. You couldn't be devil's advocate, is what I couldn't you're be devil's so advocate. Had to be so done. that was yeah. setting off an alarm yeah. in my mind that I just don't understand uh, the position. And so I had to, had to watch Fox News and get some Republican interpretation of why they were claiming that this would be a good idea. So you found reasons why the other side of the opinion felt it was a good idea. It doesn't necessarily mean that you agreed with any of those, oh, that's, right? Oh, that's right. I, I, okay. I certainly felt uh, that the true, the underlying objective, was to gain political advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not, uh, uh, there were no state legislatures making this argument in states that, in which Romney had won the presidential vote. Right, yeah. So. There, uh, there have been times when I've heard uh, differing sides of an issue, mm -hmm. um, especially in the political forum. And I've thought that, you know, these people had a good argument, these people had a good argument. Or these, they both had uh, uh, good points, maybe I should mm -hmm. say, to their arguments, but I would prefer one over the other. Of course. Yeah. But then there's also times, and I think that what you just said is more typical of this, where both sides had their, their rationale, but one I just thought had absolutely no merit. Yeah, is that okay? Or you say, oh. like, I should, should I dig further then and find some way where I could at least tell people, well, their reasoning for that is this? I mean... For me, an alarm would be going off in my head if I really could not state a, a, any justification mm -hmm. for the position. If, if all that I could say is they're trying to cheat, mm -hmm. then my yeah. alarm's going off that I don't understand the position. Yeah, you know, we hear that a lot during um, election years is that people will be for or against a particular candidate, and that, that's mm -hmm. fine. You know, we, we just are going to vote for one candidate for all these different offices. But I don't like the idea of that, that per everything that person does is perfect and everything right. their opponent or opponents do is terrible. Right. So that, because humans are so complicated, you know. So, I, you know, during the last presidential election, maybe you only liked, if you liked 80% of what Obama was saying, and 50% of what Romney was saying, well, they both had a lot of things you liked, but you picked Obama because he had the, the, the higher percentage of what you liked. So are you saying, is that kind of more the idea of trying to play devil's advocate? Well, of course, a, a political figure is more complicated than a single issue, like a single bill, maybe just, you know, it's, it's right. easier to come down it's, on it's, one it's side. It's probably of. easier to critically analyze uh, an argument. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as understanding the political system and Speaking only for myself now, critical thinking, I'm just trying to avoid error. I'm not trying to persuade mm -hmm. people. Right? But I think that party line, party affiliation is important. I think that uh, the reason a party exists is to gain political power and to govern. And that if what a person does is look at each candidate and see, well, I saw so-and-so on one occasion, and he impressed me, so I think he'd be good and vote for him, and so on, and not look at party affiliation, I think is not a good idea. I think that the system of government that, that we've got is deadlocked, uh, is a system for inaction, because you have the two com contesting parties bitterly divided, mm -hmm. uh, sharing power. I think that the nation would have a lot more accomplished if either party had control over the government than it is in our, yeah, in our is very current difficult situation yeah. deadlock. <laughs> so you're proposing a monarchy then? No, no. no I'm, I'm proposing that people understand their, uh, their own political values and vote consistently. Very good. So in our final five, six minutes here, um, we were going to talk about persuasions and arguments and fallacies. We, we did touch on that earlier, but mm -hmm. you maybe want to give us a couple examples. We have actually sure. three minutes left, so not maybe time for one example. Sure. Uh, well, uh, first off, there are uh, some fallacies that are logical. For example, affirmation of the consequent. 
and that's the, of the form uh, A implies B, and uh, uh, B is true, and concluding, therefore, A is true. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't follow logically. Okay. If A, if A implies B, B might still be true. If not, A is true. All right. Uh, so that's pure logic. Then we mentioned uh, argumentum uh, ad hominem. Uh, I saw a debate on, uh, on televisions on the Charlie Rose show between Joe Scarborough and uh, Paul Krugman. And uh, uh, Krugman was trying to argue that uh, political bills uh, should, uh, uh, economic bills, uh, should be addressing uh, building employment and economic growth that we cannot at this time, with our economy in, in, at this time, uh, concern ourselves with the federal deficit. And Scarborough was pointing out that uh, early in the century, in the early 2000s, he was saying that, uh, de that the deficits were very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Krugman was, uh, was arguing that this was an ad hominem attack. Well, uh, it's certainly uh, an attempted diversion yeah. to try to avoid talking about the, uh, the substance of, of the issue. I don't know that ad hominem was such a good description of it. He's just saying that you're inconsistent. Yeah. But at another time, you argued on the other side. And maybe if it were a debate between, between people, uh, between candidates, that might be a good argument of the sort, well, you don't know where he stands right, because he, he, wavers, he, yeah. he, he wavers. But uh, uh, in, in this case, I think it's more to, to, to quoque, yeah. or yeah, you too yeah. is that form of argument. All right. Well, that pretty much takes up our time, but thank you so much for helping explain critical thinking. My pleasure. And for telling us about the Critical Thinking Club. And again, uh, if any of our listeners are, or viewers are interested, the information is on the screen so that you can attend. You, it looks like you automatically become a member. That's right. <laughs> but hopefully they go easy on you right at first. And if you're interested in Minnesota Atheists, please contact us. We'll send you a copy of our newsletter, because if you're interested in us, we're interested in you. Uh, thanks for watching. Have a good day.